Hello, folks. Welcome to Polygon Talk again. We are almost finishing the event. And now we have a talk with Stephen Hughes. Stephen Hughes in English. And uh, I would like to ask you a question. Please answer me. What do you mean when you say you speak English? What do I mean? Yeah, please let me know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ah, uh, so the middle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Good. All right. So you're gonna. All right. Um, I need to flip the slides. Flip for you. All right. Cool. All right. So here we go. Pleasant good afternoon. Good day. Good day. Good day, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's do. Yeah. yeah. You can leave that. Leave us that slide here. Sorry. Yeah, you can eat this for now. So okay. yes, this is one. the opening slide. Brief introduction. Can I move around? Yeah, you can. I can walk. I can, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to give you, I can dance. Yeah. I can, you can do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Right? All right. So yeah, um, you're probably wondering about the question and why I give this title, right? Um, it's a view, and again, what it means to speak English today, what do we mean by that? And we want to look a little closer into this. The talk is not necessarily new, but I want to bring new light to this or provoke a little reflection about what it means when we talk about speaking English. All right, um, next slide, please. So, yeah, um I don't know if you can see all of this, but yeah, this I like doing a lot of this. I like using memes <laughs> as a teacher. So I thought this meme meant it very well. As you see, he's asking the question. And the look of, you know, somebody really, really suspicious. Like, what, what do you mean exactly? What are you trying to say when you say you speak English? And when we talk about speaking English today, it can vary from being fluent to being maybe operational or having a working knowledge of the language, right? So this is, I think, what I wanted to talk about here. Oh, yeah, wait, and thank you. That's, yeah, no, no, just right. Let's go, next slide. So here, to talk a bit about myself, right? Keep calm because I is a trinity. What is Trini? Trini is somebody from Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. So in Trinidad, we speak Trini. We don't speak English. See what I mean? So yes, English is my first language. It is the official language of the country. But we speak in our particular way. So the English sometimes might not sound exactly the same way. You might have a bit of a same songy accent. So if someday you don't you know, follow me, you can ask me to repeat, um, but this is it. So that's why I need to put this here because um, it, it will tie in, but connects to what I'm trying to talk about in this speech. What it means when you speak English. Is it British, American, whatever? So that's what it is, right? So I'm, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, two islands in the lovely Caribbean, Caribbean Sea. Right? Famous for Calypso, not the one from Joama. Yeah. Okay. Calypso, not that one. Famous for the steel pan instrument. Famous for Nicki Minaj. Famous for what else? Yeah, that's it. Nice tourism and everything. But as I said, our first language is English. We speak it as an official language. Uh, we have lots of influence from other languages. Yeah, the fact that it's a Caribbean, it's in the Caribbean region. We do have influence from, um, you know, from Spanish, from French. Um, the fact that we have about 43% of the population uh, being Indian, of uh, Indian descent, that means we have a lot of people that still speak Hindi and other Indian languages. So that also is part of our everyday lingo, uh, Trinidadian English. Okay, next slide. So. Yeah, those of you who are famous with Lord of the Rings, I've uh, seen Lord of the Rings, read the books and everything. We we'll talk about this here, and the idea of the my precious, the Smeagol, the character in the story, 
where he's always after the precious, the gem. Um, we think of the relationship we have in English nowadays, and this is what many people see in English as my precious. Oh God, I need my precious, right? And it is fleeting. It is something that it's hard for us to actually acquire because we have this dream of, you know, becoming 100% fluent and using the language, uh, let's say, based on a standard that is often sold to us, right? Um, being Eurocentric, so either UK or United States or Canada or Australia, but we don't have other references. So we tend to see English as those. And if we speak like them, then yes, our English is good. So a lot of times, and I've been here in Brazil for 26 years or so, and I often hear my students apologizing for their English. Sorry for my English. I said, what are you sorry for? Sorry for what? Right? You're not, you don't have to be sorry. You were not born speaking English. So you don't have to apologize beforehand. Another thing when you apologize, psychologically, you are defeating yourself. Because if I tell you before, well, I'm sorry, this lecture is going to be a disaster. It will be a disaster. So if you go to somebody in a job and you tell them, oh, I'm sorry, but my English is horrible, your English will be horrible. Because then I will pay attention to the mistakes. Because you told me your English is horrible. And I was like, oh, okay, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, because we do this all the time. We tend to put ourselves down thinking that if we do not speak like the precious, right, which are the standards, British or American, and this British American standard is also a myth because we don't know which American they're talking about. It's not a New Yorker, it's not somebody from Atlanta, not somebody from Texas. It's an imaginary figure that is created to tell us, well, speak like them, okay? So sometimes we have that, and we fall into that trap all the time. Next slide. So, what is language and what is English? English for most people is this, opportunity, right? So we see English as um, we need it. If we don't speak English, then we won't have a chance. We won't have a chance professionally or academically. Um, it is, what, let's say, 50% of the time, yes, true, we need English, right? But it's, I think, overrated to a certain extent. We put too much stress on that, um, place too much emphasis, and this also causes you know unnecessary pressure when you cannot speak English. Yeah. Um, and of course, we use this sometimes in many countries, Brazil including, to let's say establish some form of elimination. So you want to block people off, tell them they need English. Their job has nothing to do with English, they don't use English in their job. But you need English. Sorry? Um, where do we need English here? Where's the country? Where's the job? It's in Brazil. Do I have to speak that good English? No, but I need English. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And you don't you don't get the job because you don't speak English. So this is again a problem of and we can't change that yet, but we have to be aware that these things happen. So we see language, just go back to it, sorry. Yeah. So language as this golden ticket, right? So when we talk about language, it's more than just opportunity. But what we have to also remember that language is not a flag. Language is not a country. So what am I saying by that? When we say language in English, ooh, America. Yeah. <laughs> we think United, United Kingdom. It's not just them, okay? It's not just them. It's not ownership. They don't own the language. Nobody owns the language. The language is spoken by people, whoever wants to use it. And if they have to use it, they use it. But it's not because they own it. If they owned it, then it would become a commodity. And then we'd have to pay for it, one way or the other. It's not like that. So we tend to see this idea of your language as ownership. Oh my God, yes. Because, you know, it's there, yeah, you guys. And of course, there are those comments. Well, you come and speak my language. Yeah, you go to the country, you go to the United States. You come to my country, you have to speak my language. Okay, yes. But I might make mistakes. That's not necessarily a problem. I remember somebody talked about this yesterday, right? When 
Um, Brazilians, uh, when foreigners come here, they speak a little Portuguese with mistakes. Everybody, oh, don't fulfill. Oh, they're not in the Oh, they're not in the Oh, they're not in the Right. But when we are there, we make oh, excuse me. And then, we don't have the same treatment sometimes, right? So English is there. It is an uh, opportunity. And it's what Jay Walker refers to as um, English mania. Next slide, please. So Jay Walker talks about this in a TED Talk. I don't know if you've seen this TED Talk before, right? Go there, TED Talk, Jay Walker, English mania. So English, as he said, is becoming the language of problem solving. So when we have international conferences, when we have events, we use English. Yeah? Uh, it's the language of communication, it's the language of instruction, it has become the lingua franca. But what is interesting, he said, not because America is pushing it, well, yeah, they are, <laughs> anyway, but because the world is pulling it. Yeah, because he's American, and he owned, he owned the digital company. So I know he's saying this because we, we know why he's saying it, right? But it's interesting what he says here. Go to the next slide. And he continues. So uh, talking about this mania, is it good? Is it bad? Is English washing away other languages? No. What is an important point here, as he says, right? Your native language, your first language is yours. It's your language. So you have to continue speaking your language, no matter what. But if you speak English, if you can become part of a global conversation. And yeah, you're able to talk to people from around the world. It can open doors. But it's not the only door. See, the problem is we sell it as the only door. Say, okay, if you don't speak English, then there are no doors. No, it can open doors, but it's not the only door. Right? Cool. So, Jay Walk talks about that. Let's see what we talk about here. Go next slide, please. Notice that this is taken from, well, this author's here, right? Ayaz, Suzanne, and Malik talking about English, but look where it's in. The country, Pakistan. Pakistan speaks English. It's the official language. India speaks English as an official language, but not everyone in India speaks English. It's an official language, instructional, but they don't speak English in their everyday lives. All right, the same thing in Pakistan. So what happens is, due to the colonial legacy, English has always enjoyed a privileged position. So there are at least 40, 50 languages there, but English has always been considered the most important. So it, it's privileged. So if you speak English in India or in Pakistan, you're good to go. All right? So it's not just in Brazil we have this, let's say, um, dilemma. Another example, this one, next slide please, with, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, Trevor Noah, he's a talk show host, very funny, great comedian, does accents and stuff, he's South African, South Africa speaks English, right? Yeah, one of the languages, there are 11 official languages, right? But look what he says about English, he says that his mother insisted he learn English too, so as a black young man in South Africa, if he did not speak English, he had no opportunity. He had no choice, right? So he wanted to get a leg up, you know, to get this opportunity as a black South African. You know? So for him, it also meant opportunity. It opened doors for him, right? It's interesting you said that here. It's also, I didn't put this on the slide, but he also talked about a story where um, his parents, their family, they would pray a lot. And they would pray in all kinds of languages. But the fact that he spoke English, he said, they, his, his grandmother said, your, your prayers are more powerful because you pray in English. Your prayers are more powerful. Pray for us, Trevor, because your prayers are in English. God will hear you first. So you see the, you know, what, what, what goes on when we think about these things, how uh, we hold on to assumptions, to myths, and ideas, and these things perpetuate. So, next slide, please. Yeah. What can we say then? We are all in a relationship with English, like it or not. We are. 
Like it or not, we are in a relationship with English. What do I mean by that? In that we use English in many ways. Even if you don't speak the language regularly, even if you don't use it in your job, but you use it in social media. When you have to come across, you come across a word. When you have to play a game, when you have to use YouTube, when you have to do, do, do some shopping, you have to use English sometimes. All right? So when one of the main ideas behind this talk when I talk about when you speak English is rather than saying, do you speak English? How about talking about if you use English? How do you use English? Because many times we don't actually speak it, but we use it to read, we use it to negotiate, we use it to you know, deal with other people, to connect with people sometimes online. We use it to navigate communication, right? So think of yourself as a user of the language, not necessarily a speaker. Because when we say we speak, it has this idea, oh God, I have to be fluent. And everybody says, oh, I'm not fluent. <laughs> I'm not fluent. And fluency does not, it's not a, a destination. Okay, fluency is not a destination because we have the question again, when will I be fluent? Never. <laughs> no, because we think that at one time in our life, we're going to say yes. Now we are fluent. Hallelujah. I have arrived. Woo! Oh, glory. No. No. It will not happen like that. There may be times where you may be 100% fluent in some situations. Even in our own language, you're not fluent. So listen to us. It's just like share with some of the guys here. Listen to those guys in the SPF when they talk about in Portuguese. The, lectures and long you know speeches they give you don't understand how to what they say in Portuguese and your you are native speakers of Portuguese so we might be fluent in some situations and not fluent in others and that is fine that is normal it does not make us less or more right so if you look I did this quick search using a uh, Google Scholar and I just typed in English as an or as a, and usually look what happened because I wanted to show show you this in terms of the types of things that people normally look for, the types of searches we look we have or queries we have. So people think of English as a global language, everybody speaks it, or as a second language. So you speak French, maybe and English, or you speak Spanish and English, second language. Or English as a lingua franca. So you don't speak English, but you know English, you know, just to communicate with people from different countries. English as international. Now they have this new term, English as an additional language. Yeah? So another way of saying, so instead of saying, this is my first, my second, my third, my fourth, my fifth language, it's a language. English as an additional language, or French, or Spanish, right? Just one more. You have English as a foreign language, which is the most common form we talk about English, right? When you talk about this, what we are saying is that there is a standard that we have to follow. English is a foreign language. It's totally outside. We have no control over it. And somebody decides what we have to talk about or how we have to talk. Sounds familiar? So the standard, the native speaker is there, and we have to follow, right? English as a medium of instruction. We see it. Uh, in universities. So you have universities in Europe, China, Japan, in Brazil as well, where um, some classes are given in English. Some of my students here as well, yeah, we, the classes were given in English, but you are in Brazil, but English is the medium of instruction. Okay, so it's not something you use to talk outside. In the class, you speak English. And then we have others like a secondary language, as a world language, or language, sorry, or as a universal language. So we see that the idea, the purpose of how we look at English changes according to your context. Next slide. Please. This is from an uh, educator and linguist, right? Interesting, I wanted to share this with you here too. He talks about English as the largest of human tongues. Human languages, right? Um, disclaimer, I do not agree 100% what he says here, right? But 
when he says it's the largest of human languages, okay. Um, this is again maybe arguable when he says that it's the it has more vocabulary than the second largest language. That means Mandarin. Okay. What a point he cites here is that English has become inevitably the lingua franca for many reasons. Not because English is beautiful, not because English is easy. It's economic, it's political. Yeah. Not because if it were the case, mm -hmm. I mean, you guys love phrasal verbs, don't you? No, yeah. you don't. Yeah. So if that were the case, English would never be the lingua franca because we, we hate phrasal verbs, we hate present perfect, <laughs> right? You hate, yes, you hate that. So it would never be the language of choice. If we had a choice, it would not be English. Yeah, it wouldn't be Portuguese, maybe. I don't know. Who knows, right? So it's saying, and he argues that English is the most flexible, right? Flexible in what way? When he says by flexible, meaning that English has the capacity to borrow words from other languages and don't give them back. We, we borrow the words, so the word becomes English. So, for example, now, a soap opera is telenovela. In America, we don't say soap opera. We say sometimes soap, but we say it's a telenovela because of the Spanish influence in the United States. So it's an English word. No, this word is English. Yeah. For example, favela is English now. Yeah. It's in the dictionary. Brazilian slum, definition. Fish water. It's an English word now. Oh, huh? yeah. They borrow the words. Sorry. And they don't give them back. They don't give it back. They borrow. Yeah, just borrow. So when he says it here, right, that's what makes it the richest and most flexible. So you think of tons of words we have in English came from the colonization period. That English, they took words like bungalow, hammock. These words were not English words. These words existed in the local languages, and then they were absorbed into English. Kangaroo is not. English. It was the Aborigines that called it kangaroo. I said, oh, thank you. I'll use that now. And you know, let's kill the Aborigines. But it's an Aborigine word. Okay. So English, I like this, swallows up anything that comes its way and makes English out of it. Right? It has this capacity to um, anglicize or Englishize this thing. Okay? So it's something for us to remember. Then, uh, the idea of language. So still, we talk about language again, right? It is the vehicle of trans transmission of values and culture. So our language is important to transmit who we are, what we believe in, you know, uh, what is what is dear to us, right? what we consider important. So if we recognize people's language, as it says there, we recognize their voice. So we need to recognize that there are other languages to accept that. All right? Next slide. So, ah, we have visitors. Yes, there we go. Oh, hey. Yes? We have visitors. We have visitors. Just a minute. Oh. <laughs> right? So, uh, Simon Hoffer talks about uh, ELF. ELF is what we call English as a lingua franca. Right, so this is a term now that has become more and more popular, where we think of English being used in different contexts. Right, so we have natives, not native speakers, but people from different nationalities can speak English. So let's say, oh, you're from China, you're from Germany, you speak English, I speak English, no, let's speak English, great. But it's not our first language. Right? So this language or English that I know will be a little different from the English that you know, and we have to adapt it and adjust it. So sometimes it might not sound 100% Englishy, you know, but there might be some mistakes. It, you might have some new verbs coming in. You have some new ways of saying things. But the main purpose is communication, right? It's communicating and it works, right? So we don't share common native tongue. And what happens is that English becomes this chosen language. So that is what English has become for many people, right? Not in everyday communication, but only, but you can see it in you know, professional context. If you work in a multinational company, if you work in a cruise ship, if you work where you have tons of nationalities, 
you would have sometimes to use English, right? Next slide. So, do you feel like this sometimes? Yeah, I think why I'm using this gift with mystique is to re reinforce that idea of how English takes different forms and different shapes according to the speakers, according to the people that are communicating, English will look very different. So the English spoken by two, let's say, native speakers, Americans or two British guys speaking to each other, right? It's gonna be different to the English spoken by a Brazilian talking to somebody from Germany, but it's English. It's, you know, it's not, oh, it's better, it's worse, it's English. This is what I'm trying to say here. So that we are able to morph and adapt, take shape according to the necessity, according to the person who's speaking with. And that is fine, right? Think of, I think we can talk about this because everybody had lunch, right? Yes, it's a slight aside. So think of an international dish, something that has become an international, it was, it was invented somewhere. And it became, we could say, international, like huh? pizza. pizza or lasagna or stroganoff, sushi. sushi, right? So think of sushi or stroganoff, <laughs> invented in Russia, like stroganoff. So think of the first time it was exported to other countries, right? And think of somebody, a Russian chef, visiting this country and seeing people making stroganoff. They would be horrified, right? <laughs> Oh, 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 it's the tragedy. They're destroying my meal. This is not struggling on. It's not. Not the way they invented it. But it's now Brazilian struggling on. Well, or worse. Or Brazilian pizza. Or chocolate pizza. Or chocolate pizza. <laughs> or pizza with pineapples in, a, in the United States, right? Ketchup on pizza. Or ketchup on pizza. And girls. Mango sushi, yeah. So they are changes according to the local flavor works. What am I getting at? The same thing happens with English. You go to a different country, you will have a little change. You will have something that would reflect that local culture. And that is okay. You get used to it. Of course, at the beginning, the Russian Indians will think, well, it's a sacrilege. Oh my God. They have destroyed my recipe. Yeah? He may think that. And rightly so. He or she would think that way, right? Because it's not the same. It is not. And that is um, not a problem. At least not for us, but maybe for them. Because <laughs> they would have to get used to it. But it's getting used to this. This is the idea. We have to get used to this new form. All right? As I said yesterday as well, where you're going to speak that. And a lot of times, um, I remember back in the day when you would have, we would like sign up people for, for English classes and the parents would come and ask us, so what, what English do you guys teach here? Um, do you guys teach American or British? And the guy, and the guy next to me said, Brazilian. <laughs> and the guy almost left the room. But what he was trying to say is they're Brazilian teachers. And that doesn't mean that the English they're going to teach is going to be any less or, you know, inferior to the one that they would get. Ah, but you don't have any native speakers here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we speak Portuguese. Native speakers. No, I mean American. Mm -hmm. No, but all of them study and they know English very well. Better than native speakers, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, we have this misconception about that. So speaking of the native speaker, and again, another example, I love using me, right? So when he says this, right? Don't always speak English, but when I do, yeah, I am the reference. I am the native speaker. Yes. So my English is good. Yeah, you accept it because I am the native speaker. Okay? So we have always seen this as the, okay, the holy grail. Right, the parameter that we have to live up to. It's not good enough if you don't speak like that. Well, you know, not good enough. Uh, there's a story I told about this uh, friend of mine who was in the UK. Nothing as the British, right? They, she was in the UK and she's asking for directions to go to the theater. Uh, theater, yeah. But 
the British, she asked the lady, and the lady was, you know, kind of picky and insisting that she said, theater. Yeah. Yeah. So she said, oh, can I get to the, I want to get to the theater. Said, and she said, sorry, where? Yeah. To the theater. I'm, I'm sorry, do you mean where? Come again, please. Um, this, oh, you mean the theater? <laughs> The girl was like, yes, the theater, that's right, see, so that's the place I want to go to. Can you tell me now where I have to go? Well, it's there, right there. She could have said that before, but again, so you have situations where people can be a bit picky. There's another situation where this time I was in the United States, um, asking for instructions and wanted to get somewhere, or directly, sorry. And you know, wanted to get somewhere, and she used the English, you know, English that she learned at school. And she went, Excuse me, can you tell me how to get to, you know, those things? I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the museum. Do you know how to get to this place? And the guy didn't understand at first, and he was like, what? Say what? Said, no, no, I, I want to get to. Say what? Come again, girl. <laughs> and he was very getting a bit impatient with her. And he said, girl, girl, you, you sound like a book. <laughs> yeah, like, just you came out like a textbook. You sound like a book. Speak American. <laughs> what is American? It's not a language. But what he meant by that was, speak the way we speak. Speak like us. Yeah, but she didn't know how to speak like them. She is still learning. But this is important we understand that sometimes when you get to another country, yeah, you might not understand everything. At first, but because there are different ways to say the same thing, it happens, right? So let's go, please. A next example. This time, look at this the comparison now with the non native speaker and the native speaker. This is lovely. So the non native speaker is like, I apologize for my terrible English in advance, it is not my native tongue. So please bear with me for every foolish mistake I would make throughout the entirety of the conversation. Forgive me. I have sinned. And the guy's like, oh, uh, okay, lol. <laughs> yes. See? So, a lot of times we are worried about trying to speak really well and then it'll make our English look like, ooh, perfect, right? And the guy's just like, what are you doing? Or, you, you know, you make sure you, you put the questions, do you like going to the movies? And the guy says, you like movies? <laughs> yeah, it happens, all right? So this is it. So next slide. What are we proposing then? If we talk about English as uh, more international or lingua franca, okay, we need to think of a more decolonial way of thinking of English. So it is moving away from the standards that we consider the well, I mean, always at the parameter. So we think of multilingualism. So even when you talk about speaking English, you have to consider other languages, the effect that other languages have on English. Okay? And using sometimes translanguaging. Have you heard of that before? Let me give an example. Next slide, please. This is translanguaging. This happens a lot. This happens a lot. Yeah, when, and it happens a lot to, uh, especially to young kids who grew up in two or three different uh, languages, or they have, let's say, their parents, yeah, dad is from Germany, their mother is from Spain, they, they live in Brazil, and they, have, they speak an international country or international school where they speak English, and they, this, is, this is normal. This is normal, okay? And it's not necessarily wrong, it is how they're communicating. Right, so I love this, right? When do you can't? Cuando you can't find la palabra en un idioma, so you fill it con la otra. And you understand, right? So this happens a lot. It's a challenge because you think, how are we going to correct, or what, how do we work with that in the classroom? That's going to be challenging, right? But it's just as an example. Go back to previous slide. Previous slide. Okay? So multilingualism, yeah. Then you think of the idea of taking the knowledge from the local, um, you know, not just references, but local history, right? What what works for local people? So there's a, a group of students, we went to Pantanal, 
right? So, of course, they didn't, I don't say of course, but they don't speak English in the Batana. But the fact that my students speak English, I asked them to do a report on wetlands, right? wetlands around the world. So they had to do research about wetlands in English, and then they had to interview people in Pantanal while they were there in Portuguese, and then translate it to English to talk about the experience. So they interviewed people, found out about their lifestyle, uh, what is it like to live in the Pantanal, but then they had to come and report it in English. So it's taking the local knowledge and making it part of the syllabus, making it part of their learning. And it gave them a chance to you know, connect with each other as well. Revise the syllabus so they can involve and include more voices. Intersectionality, where you work with not just English, but maybe geography, history, arts, etc. Right? Getting the community involved. So involving parents, involving the neighborhood, involving groups and other activities whenever possible. Critical pedagogy, right? I think most of us have heard of Paulo Freire. Right, so beginning and asking and pro promoting critical thinking with your students all the time. So when they read something, oh, is that 100% correct? Or do we accept that? Or is it the only way? Is that the only way we can see this story, right? Prioritization of different voices in the, in the school, um, something more institutional, making sure that students and the school as a whole are embraces this idea of including not just English from the United States or UK, but English from Australia, English from Ireland, English from wherever. I use a lot of newspapers from the Al Jazeera newspaper. Al Jazeera. Yes, Al Jazeera. I use newspapers from India. I use newspapers from uh, Sri Lanka, from the Caribbean. I don't just take CNN or The Guardian. I do sometimes take it, but I also share other news reports about the same thing. All right? So try to make it as diverse as possible so that students can have a wider view of things. Next slide. Oh, yeah, next one, sorry. So we think of it this way. I like using this imagery as well, right? We think of English being constantly shaped and reshaped and molded according to our needs, right? This is the idea. So um, I want to, let's say, stimulate this, this reflection with all of you here about what we mean when we say, oh, I speak English, or we speak English. What English are we talking about? Um, does it matter if I speak, you know, perfect English, there's no such thing, if it makes a difference, or how am I using this English in my, uh, let's say, communication needs, all right? And of course, looking for ways to constantly improve, but seeing it from a more critical perspective. So this is the idea here. Uh, if I have enough time, just go to the next slide. I'll show you uh, this last comment here, All right? So this Baker talks about the need to move away from the traditional target language or target culture, which is United States, UK, right, or Eurocentric, and bring in other cultures to the classroom or to your learning. So look at different ways, look at different authors. We have so much, we can read in so many different possibilities now with the internet. We have access to, you know, tons of authors, not just the traditional authors, right? Not just traditional movies or the traditional TV series, right? Why not watch a TV series from other parts of the world, right? In English, why not? Or even other languages, right? I think this is very important. And uh, let me just show you now a poem. So I can move to the next slide. Go to the next slide, please. This poem, yeah. I don't know if you can see all of it. Yeah, just bring it up there. Yeah, just don't worry. It's great. Yeah, it's a bit too... Ah, there it is. Thank you. So this is from... The name of the poem is A Search for My Tongue. Okay, Sujata Bhatt, she's Indian. She, she resides in uh, the U.S. Right, so she talks about this search for her tongue or her identity. Because your language is your identity. Who you speak is who you are. So he says, that's what I mean by saying I've lost my tongue. I ask you, what would you do if you had two tongues in your mouth? So she's talking about her native language and English. And lost the first one, the mother tongue, and could not really know the other, the foreign tongue. You could not use them both together even if you thought that way. And if you lived in a place you had to speak a foreign tongue, your mother tongue would rot, rot and die in your mouth until you had to spit it out. I thought I spit it out. 
So she said that she had, she felt forced to forget her mother tongue, forget her original tongue. But overnight, while I dream, next slide, her mother tongue appears. I don't know how to pronounce this. So I'm not going to try. Ah. But if you go on YouTube, you can find it. She, she, she recites it really well. Right? So this is her mother tongue. She's talking about what happens in her dream. And then she goes back to English. Next slide. It grows back. A stump of a shoot grows longer, grows moist, grows strong, veins. It ties the other tongue in knots. The bud opens. The bud opens in my mouth. It pushes the other tongue aside. Every time I think I've forgotten, forgotten my mother tongue, I think I've lost my mother tongue, it blossoms. So she thinks when she thinks she lost or she loses this mother tongue, it's there, it comes back, right? And it's alive. That's the most important thing. All right. So that's it. Next slide. And thank you. Um, you want to show the next? Yeah, so my, my references and yeah, go back there, please. Last two slides. Yeah, last two actually. But yeah, the last one's right. Yeah, so you can, if you you want to find me on social media, that's why I am. You can scan under those. Um, I'm going to share it with them. All right, cool. Um, I think we have, do you have time for questions or? Comments? Yeah, two questions. All right. perhaps. So did I answer your question? Yeah. The first one. Uh, well, recently in a polyglot club meeting, someone told me that they were told by a British person that foreigners who are not native in English, they don't speak English. They practice English. Ah, uh, have you heard that? Well, okay. Practice makes perfect. That's what I would tell them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, maybe they don't speak it. But again, nobody grows or is born perfect into perfection. So even if, let's say, you are a native speaker, you still have, um, you know, to learn and use the language appropriately, right? Native speaker doesn't give you an automatic, um, let's say, certificate to fluency or to accuracy. That's another thing because when we think native speaker, we think automatically, yeah, we speak wonderful English. So the pronunciation is, yeah, it's good. Yeah, they have all the intonation, the accent, um, and of course, they use all the verbs. Yeah, everything is perfect. So this, uh, again, we have been led to think that that is the model, right? So that then you think, oh, well, you're, you're just practicing. So practice until you get better, <laughs> maybe. But again, I would just ignore that. It happened recently, not with me, but this thing about a native speaker, I, for many years, when I came to Brazil, uh, people would see me as a native speaker as well. So when I said, oh, I'm from China, oh, she's speaking English. Yeah, it's my first language. So you have, automatically, I was open to privileges. Like, oh, I'm a native speaker, yes. Like, no, I'm serious. I had, I had, um, I remember when I started a, a language school, the fact that I was a native speaker, I was automatically, automatically, sorry, promoted to coordinator of the school. All right. I have no experience as a coordinator. But the fact that I spoke English, French, Spanish, made me coordinator. All right, all right, cool. Yeah, so that was the first time. And then I had my reality check where I was in, it was here in Rio during, uh, it was Christmas time. And um, I think I told, told the story a few times already, but I met um by chance was around the the place called Lagoa, Rodrigo Freitas, right? So it was a Christmas tree day and everything, people taking pictures. There was an American family, you know, a bit lost that they, had, they were trying to find help. Nobody spoke English. So I gladly helped. And I you know, told him what to do and so on. And the father came to me, you know, and he was, you know, he was trying, thinking he was going to say something nice to me. He said, whoa, your English is really good, bro. <laughs> because he thought I was Brazilian. <laughs> well, notice, notice me, right? He's like, man, your English is really good. Where, where did you learn it? <laughs> And I said, no, 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 no. I was like, no, no, but I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not Brazilian. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. And then it, there was a problem, you know, you know, the loading. <laughs> so he was like, he, he did this. And he looked at me and there was this pause, dramatic pause. You know, and he's like, oh, but I mean, your English is really good. So you see, 
For him, I'm not an English speaker. <laughs> the fact that I'm not from the United States of Trinidad, I am not an English speaker for him. Okay. Yeah, so this is an we example. Have, we, have, we have a question here. Yeah. Evie. No. I don't speak that well English, but I I understand everything you said, and I have two questions. I'm going about this. Yeah. Uh, this is I think this is. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, this is difficult to have to on intelligence on person and does everything, but don't speak well, or in the mother. I don't know if you are a translator. I'm a translator? Yeah. No, I don't translate. I do more proofreading. You know, I, I help. I say people who translate and they need somebody to revise. Because, again, a lot of um, um, scientific magazines and journals, they ask for what they call heavy zone, the taste. So they ask um, that this these texts be revised by a native speaker. So they only accept academic. <laughs> Um, articles, any publishing, if it's revived by native speaking. So I, I normally do these proofreading things. So is there another question? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know what the question is. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think. It's the answer here. Yeah. But the translator, and it's necessarily. And it is to need to say very well English. Well, as a so translator, translator yeah. not necessarily has to speak English. No, not necessarily. necessarily. I mean, as a translator, no, if you're working with interpreting, definitely you would need to. But as a translator, you don't necessarily have to speak English. You have to read a lot, you have to know the language well, um, just, you know, you're listening and so on. So I think you have to immerse yourself. Either way, you need to immerse yourself in the language, in both languages, actually, in English and in Portuguese, because a lot of times there are things that you have to be able to translate from Portuguese to English. For example, right? there was this whole discussion the other day about how you would say um, chuchuca. <laughs> how would you translate that? And there was a big discussion about how to translate chuchuca. Yeah, chuchuca do central. <laughs> there was no, there's no translation for that, right? So how do you Put that into English. So your knowledge of the other language that can make sense, because you have to do what we call uh, localization, right? You have to adapt and make use something that the other people, the target reader, would understand. Because you know, and then it, it was really tricky. It was tricky. Right? Two more questions. Okay. Yes, Carla. I, I don't know if we apply to the importance of nature, but I was wondering if one aspect of this domination of the English idiom is not the fact that it has many umbrella terms. And I, I, I was about to ask you if you think it, it applies, but only if you have ever thought about it, because I don't want to take it by surprise. No, no problem, no surprise at all, because we have many terms. You have, as you said, English as international language, EIL, English as a global language, EGL. So you have lots of acronyms. EIL, EGL, EFL, ELF, ESL, EAL, ELL, uh, um, e, um, English um, for academic English. So you have a lot of acronyms. And what these acronyms actually do is to try to make make distinction between these groups. Yeah. 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 So you have this umbrella term, which would be English as an international language. So, but within that, you have ELF, you have EGL, you have, yeah, so you have a lot of terms within it. Um, but there is this, for example, Penny Cook talks about this umbrella term as a myth. So he says that this idea is actually too presumptuous that you try to make this one term that can encompass everything. It's impossible. That's impossible. Last question now. Yeah. Um, I want to say that, uh, first of all, it was a great talk. I really wish my lots of my friends that are not native speakers in English, they would, uh, they would uh, listen to that because I have many friends that, uh, for example, work in other skip jobs because they don't speak confident in English. In this case, that's very sad, I think, for me. Um, 
but uh, I just wanted to make a small remark. Uh, I spent most of time in, in the UK, so um, obviously you don't know that when you first go there, but then you notice know, even English people, they don't really speak correct English. So there are a lot of people that speak very incorrectly, not to even mention like rightly, a lot of people just write completely incorrectly. Sometimes I had to read the text to like an email or message in English and like, what? I just don't understand the word, but when I, for example, they try to uh, write phonetically, I mean, like what they oh. that what they write, not necessarily correctly, because sometimes you know the same word and at the same time you can write different way in English. So when I try to read it aloud, then I, then I understood what they meant because I can hear what they try were trying to speak. So, uh, and obviously in English there are also many dialects. I didn't know that before coming and going to England. I had everybody speak like fully English. No, it's not right. You know, people speak in different dialects. Like in Yorkshire, people speak really, very strange English compared to, to full English, like the, the um, official language. So it's even very difficult to understand them and learn this kind of dialect, this kind of language. Wow, well, thanks for that. I mean, this again, it just reinforces what we said. I mean, and in Brazil, any country, you will have people that speak the language or don't speak it correctly, or uh, let's say they're not able, not that they don't speak it correctly, but we have what we call code switching. So that in everyday situations, I speak informally, but if I need to, I can also write correctly or use the language correctly. So if you're able to code switch, that's that's good. When I grew up, uh, when I grew up in Trinidad, for example. Um, we always, we, as children, we would always hear, speak proper English. Proper English meant using the, you know, verb sentences, everything. So in English, we'd say, in Trinidad, in English, we'd say, um, I don't go, I don't go, you know, or she does go. But for us, it makes perfect sense. Within the Trini variety, that is well used syntax. But when we had to, went to school, we, we were told, no, no, that is wrong. Everything you say at home is wrong. They would tell us that. Everything you say at home, forget what you say at home. No, they do. My mom, no, no. Do not even think of saying or speaking like that in school. So we had to learn proper English. And when we stepped out of the gate, we went back to our normal English. So it's strange. It's, it's an identity shock as well. Okay, finally, last question. Let's be quick now. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. I was just uh, wondering, is that you open a language school? Was it here in Brazil or in, yeah, it was here in Brazil? No, I was, I was hired to um, work at school. I didn't come to school. Ah, okay. I was hired. Okay. And I was, I was completely by chance. I was walking, you know, I just got into Brazil like one week. I was walking around, I saw this language sense, and I came in. And I said, hey, um, you guys need English teachers. And I got with me. He went inside, spoke to somebody, he came back, and the, the owner said, can you start today? <laughs> <laughs> no, that wait, my question was not there. Yeah, that was it. I was just uh, wondering, because you talked to the on like the native speakers and um, kind of thing, right? Which is like seeing native speakers as a model for language. And I feel like sometimes, a lot of times, actually, this native speaker model is not racialized enough. Like, um, people think that, okay, the ideal native speaker is actually like a white person, right? Like a white standard person oh. from the inner circle, you know, like the US or Canada. Yeah. Deep inner circle. Yeah. So I was just wondering like, uh, if you've had any experience as yes. a racialized person that's not from the yeah. inner circle. Definitely. In Brazil here with students, um, mm -hmm. like how do you think your perceptions are? My perception, yeah. How it, it goes like that. I remember walking into the, the uh, lecturer or let's say going to, let's say the class is about to start. I would walk in and I would sit and everybody is chatting and students waiting for the professor to enter. And then they say, well, the professor's not here. I would not have And then because my name, usually but this, now it's easy because you have the internet and people can look you up on the internet. But when people saw my name, they immediately thought blonde, tall, blue eyes, <laughs> Stefan Arthur Solomon Hughes. So then this guy must be gringo and he must be blonde he must be British. <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> so I walked in, 
And they were like, mm -hmm. and then one of them turned to me, and I was like, and I was speaking Portuguese, sorry. I was just listening to checking and it was undercover. And they were like, they were under there. It's not the same shit. Yeah, it's me. But we'll see. That's what they will say to me. But that's your name. Yes, my name is Lapan. But how come? Because that's my name. You see? So a lot of times they would have this idea that um, I could not be a native speaker. What the name I had? Um, there are lots. There are lots of things. The fact, for example, they said in Trinidad we have um, from African descent, Indian descent. We don't have a large white population. So for us, the, the idea of black white is actually black versus Indian. Yeah? So we have a different race issue in Trinidad, actually. So for, for me, this thing about, oh, you're black, you're white, it didn't really, but when I got here, I understood a little bit more. Um, so people would look at me, but oh, you're not black. So what am I? What's that? What am I? Yeah. So you don't have the definition. So it, I, had to, I had to work with those things. Uh, when I talked about black issues in the classroom, they would students would question me. But sir, you are not black. Why are you talking about this? Because it's important. But it doesn't matter to you. It's like, of course it matters to me. <laughs> Even if I were not black, it should, should matter. You see, so there's this idea of only black, if you're only black, then you should talk about being black or black issues. It's difficult. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thanks so much. Okay. Huh? You get a good sound? Yeah. We did it in the morning. I did, okay. okay. But...